Hello everyone, wherever you are in the world. Um, as Andrew said there, we do have Kengo here with us. So Kengo is a key part of the collaboration uh, process that's been um, evidenced across a couple of projects that we're going to speak to you today, um, which we realised together at Macquarie University. So the one on the screen you can see here is the clinical education building for the Faculty of Medicine at Macquarie University. It's now branded as the Ainsworth building as Mr. Ainsworth is the major benefactor uh, who supplied a lot of the funding for it. And we're going to also talk about the project we did at Macquarie University that preceded this one, also Mass Timber, um, and it's the incubator, which is a, a project that we're equally proud of. But to begin with, um, we're going to take a little bit of a diversion, um, and that's just to convey some of the um, I suppose passion and interest and delight we have in creating things out of timber. So professionally we make or we design buildings that others make for us of course in that process but we also make things ourselves. So just quickly I wanted to share with you the experience of um, using beautiful timber materials uh, sourced from um, Australia in this case to fabricate a um, a beautiful boat and for the structural engineers out there this is a monocoque construction um, which was realized using Australian native uh, hardwoods so there's Australian red cedar which is most of what you can see a sheer line of hue and pine and then in the aft and fore stems there are spotted gums uh, material which of course has a great hardness um, criteria to it so the the genesis behind um, this project was sourcing the materials uh, locally. And if you um, paddle a kayak, you might do anywhere between 10 and 1,000 kilometres in a, a journey, uh, remarkably. So the backyard for this kayak is the east coast of Australia, um, stretching across Bass Strait and down to Tasmania. And that's where the materials for this boat um, were derived from. So up on the north coast, spotted gum, Australian red cedar around Gloucester, there were some shells also crafted into it and hue and pine, of course, from southwestern Australia. And I, I describe this because um, it's similar to how we source materials for our buildings. Um, it is our desire to uh, get them sustainably sourced from sustainable forests um, that are local to their construction site. Um, and that's obviously for good reason. And the process began with this kayak of building a, a kind of skeleton, which was the framework upon which uh, the, the hull and the deck were fabricated. And I'll just go through these quickly and you can appreciate the process of milling, scarfing, and then beveling and joining the material into something that, um, you know, is completely different from its sources being a tree, um, but it has this wonderful characteristic, the richness and warmth of timber its ductility and strength, especially when it's bonded with a resin and uh, a fiberglass coating. And you get this great um, capacity for monocoque construction, which is also a structural principle for uh, aircraft design. And there it is, it actually works and it's a beautiful, elegant boat and it looks gorgeous as well. So thanks for that diversion. Let's now draw or take our attention to this project and we're, we're broadcasting to you today from Sydney in Australia. And the two projects that we're going to speak to are at a tertiary institution northwest of the CBD called Macquarie University. And it's here that we have realised um, the clinical education building, which is probably the focus of our discussion today, but also the incubator, which was the first project um, we got to do at that campus. So let's have a look at case study number one, the incubator. This project uh, was um, procured through a design competition process. And so very early on in the process, uh, the Arup and Architectus team got together and we pondered the opportunities for how we could respond to this brief. So the purpose in the competition uh, stage of the process was defined as providing a, an environment for collab collaboration between the education aspects of the university campus and local industry. 
so that specifically is is some of the um, the world's leading industry businesses in the Macquarie Park region surrounding the university. And it's a place for knowledge transfer between students, academics, um, researchers, uh, the young business entities that come into the incubator and of course industry. And it's all to try and accelerate um, young businesses into the marketplace. A key part of the brief for us as designers was that the project had to be rapidly built. There was less than one year available from the commencement of the design competition to the date at which there had to be handover to the university for occupation. And key as well to the design process was this item. We were told that the building might have to be re relocated in five years and therefore we'd have to have an approach to how that could be achieved. So here we are, this is a photo that I think my mate here Kengo took, but it shows our initial design team which comprised Heiko Shepherds from Arup for sustainability and mechanical matters, my colleague Nicolaius here at Architectus, Mike King, principal at um, Arup and myself working out our first um, concepts to this process. I'd like to just quickly take you through a matrix tree of decisions that had to be made. So in terms of our clients' needs, um, they could have upgraded an existing building to provide the facility for this incubator, but they had chosen to build. And knowing that they had to potentially relocate the use of the incubator out of this building, they faced three choices at that point. They could either demolish that building and then repurpose that site for some other use, or they could upgrade the building for its other use, but they chose that they actually wanted to move the building. So they would keep it, but just put it somewhere else on their campus. And so you can imagine that really helps define the design response. In terms of relocating a building, I think there are two primary choices. It can either be picked up and relocated as a, a sort of volumetric um, entity, or it could be disassembled into smaller components and reassembled on its new site. And that was the path that our design team took. And when we got to that point, we had to think, well, how are we going to make this thing um, engineered, engineered? How will it stand up? And that's where we um, pondered three opportunities. Mike, what do you recall from that time and what we were thinking about? Well, I think one of the key things was that because the theme was innovation that we wanted to have a system that was um, modular and uh, able to be dismantled easily and then re-erected, but then also something that was going to be innovative in its approach and very visibly innovative. And, and that's how we sort of ended up narrowing down onto the uh, lamella system for the, um, for the timber, timber structure. Okay, so what is a hub? Well, it's a place for collaboration. It's essentially a workplace, although this one also had educational aspects. And typically a hub um, is developed within an existing building environment. So you have the boundaries of um, the building fabric into which modular or bespoke furniture is organized to facilitate all the different modalities that might occur within the lifespan of a, of a typical hub. Our response for this competition process was well, let's try to activate the outside. We're doing a new building after all. So we had pr provide, um, proposed a whole range of complementary uses that would draw people from elsewhere on the campus to come to the hub and therefore curate the potential for incidental uh, meetings and gatherings, which would just re enrich the whole experience of um, the incubator and its purpose to accelerate young businesses. So we would proposed a cafe, a bike workshop and a sushi bar even on the exterior. And just a couple of quick sketches during the competition phase that really helped to describe our approach. So this little section here on the left, which indicates our really fundamental structural move, wasn't it, Kengo Mike, to put the structure on the exterior, on the perimeter of the building, to span a roof across that, and then to infill with our envelope and indeed all of the accommodation to the interior and then to express that roof as a floating form and illuminate it from beneath. And we also were conscious of um, in generating that column free workspace, um, being able to reticulate services in discrete ways. So we had a cassette floor system into which all of the um, mechanical and electrical um, conduits were run. 
and then just quickly on some ESD issues, we were using the thousand square meters of reef, although it was only 500 at this stage in the competition, to generate power with um, being a platform for PV arrays, capturing rainwater and reusing that to irrigate the landscape, and then making our internal space tunable. So allowing the occupants to tune their environment and draw fresh air and indeed purge the building at the end of the day. And this was our concept. So after two or three weeks of working, this was the structural and architectural solution we proposed, which has um, really the fundamental characteristics of um, the scheme that we've ended up with today. And you can see here, it's got the big floating roof uh, platform with the elegant distribution of the structural forces down into the footings. And Mike can, can go, this has got the lamella structure, hasn't it, at this stage? Yeah, so at this point, we were we still adopted the lamella system. We thought it, it created a real beauty to the form of the structure. And then I think on the following slide, you can see on the underside, um, because the underside of the, the roof was such a feature architecturally, it was something that uh, that I think was was a key to, to I think, winning um, the competition and, and the theme of innovation. Um, but it's interesting as it evolved, how we then moved away from that. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Mm. But the essential characteristics of the project were here, weren't they? From Absolutely. Day one. So this long span uh, structure spanning out of the page towards you, distributing its uh, forces down into point loads, which are taken down into the earth, which we'll talk about in a moment, and a great clarity and separation of roof plane from the infill of the wall framing system, which could be free then to um, compose and express itself in quite delightful ways and a conceptual illustration of the interior and what that might feel like. And you can see here, we had a very holistic approach to the um, use of timber-based products, um, both for the building structure, revealing all of that, not hiding it, um, expressed in the vertical plane, of course, and of course, in the floor plane. So here we were proposing a cork finish um, to offset all of the timber furniture and joinery in that space as well. As we moved into, oh, we were very lucky, weren't we? We won the competition. And then as we moved into the design development phase, we got more of a fleshed out brief from our client at Macquarie University property. And it was for a thousand square meters of accommodation and positioned on a, a gently sloping uh, wooded area of Macquarie University's campus. Whereas previously we had no site in the competition phase. We now had a site that we had to respond to. And our key move here was to break the program into two volumes joined by a, a sort of a, an inclined or hinged element that made up the fall across the slope. So on this volume here, we have really the education components um, of the incubator, which allow for the conduction of fora and presentations and pitches and engagement with industry and external advisors. Then at the other end of the development, we had really the incubator workspace itself, which was an open plan environment supported by some uh, meeting pods where private conversations around intellectual property could occur. And then in the middle was the hinge, which was the admin component, the director of the incubator, their support staff, and a kitchen uh, environment with this uh, direct, uh, very gentle ramp between the two facilities. And on this plan, um, Kengo, I might you to talk a little bit to the structural approach. Sure. For the floor structure system, we use the timber modular cassette, which increased assembly efficiency, reduced site uh, construction times and wastage, and improved operating safety during the construction process. We also use st uh, steel screw piles for the foundation instead of in situ concrete, which can be installed quickly and is relocatable. I think I, I suppose the other thing about keeping the uh, the vertical structure and the lateral structure on the outside, it left flexibility in terms of the toilet pods, etc. But from a multidisciplinary point of view, they're they're important for services as well because uh, the the return air comes from the top of those, so that we're leaving um, the underside of the roof completely free of um, of ducting, cabling, or any other services. And you can see that illustrated here in this section where. The roof form with its long span uh, primary elements uh, has this lovely clarity throughout both pavilions and the reticulation of services and supply air is through the floor cassette system um, of this one level building. And perhaps just quickly in the few minutes left on uh, this first project, 
we'll just talk to the detail section set out. So beginning down here, Ken Go and Mike, it was your idea that we'd have this screw pile system because that would, from the very beginnings, allow the project um, to be potentially uh, relocatable in the future, wasn't it? Yeah. And then that accepts the load from the roof structure coming down in uh, flat elevation, and you can see it here in three dimensions, the glue laminated uh, hardwood columns, and then of course the primary beams with their cantilever. Now these elements are uh, 20 metres long, tip to tip, with a 14 metre span, and that meant that when um, our contractor and their specialist subcontractor, so that was Lip, um, Lipman with Strong Build, came on board, they had some really good um, uh, contributions to make around things such as getting the materials to site and indeed getting the blank material into Australia because it was imported, of course, for those elements. So just the other point, how it evolved from the lamella system into simpler primary elements. Um, the lamella system was beautiful because there's lots of uh, smaller, shorter length elements and, and very easy to assemble in terms of components, but um, it would have been many, many more connections and it would have deflected more. We would have had to pre-camber the roof. So we made a decision at a point to, to simplify the system into the, the 20 meter long elements, but we, we kept the, the legacy, I suppose, of, of the form of the um, lamella in, in the shape of the uh, secondary member. So it created a very beautiful underside. And we wouldn't have gone in that direction, I think, if we'd gone straight to a, a simpler system. So it was a nice evolution. And just quickly on this little axonometric, I'll just point out, this is the manually operated wall panel that the occupants of the building can use at any time of the day or night. Um, it's got a little hand mechanism to wind it in and out. And then at high level, we have mechanically um, actuated uh, glazed panels that are used to purge the building if that's required at the end of a day or just to bring in air during the course of the day. And again, the occupants can um, operate that themselves. Now, one of the great uh, things about this project that we hadn't intended to be like this, but it was an absolute theatrical pleasure to witness, was the building uh, coming together very rapidly on site. So from start to finish, this building uh, was built in less than five months. So that's the time from the beginning that the contractor got access to the site to hand over to the client. And that could only have been achieved with this modular prefabricated approach. And perhaps most dramatically in all of those elements coming together were the two nights in which a thousand square meters of roofing was brought together and assembled, um, being delivered to, to site on long truck, craned and with one person on a rope and one person up on a platform with a, a, um, a large uh, drill, just bringing these elements beautifully together. Is that how you imagined it would be, Mike and Ken? Yeah, I can get. Probably not as simple as it ended up. <laughs> but hats off to Littman and Strong Build, mm. uh, Adam and Tim Strong, for realising this solution. And you can see here on these photographs on the next morning, essentially after the project was finished, before the landscape had, um, designed by Aspect Studios had time to fill in, the building had a beautiful clarity. It's very faithful to its concept design and um, radiates a beautiful warmth through the timbers, which we might tell you about a bit now. Yeah, so the timbers uh, that we use are glue lamb and European spruce for uh, the primary and secondary elements to the roof. Um, CLT for the top surface, uh, which also formed a diaphragm. Um, and then the V-shaped columns were Vic Ash um, uh, fabricated locally. And in terms of architectural materials, um, we had a, a beach um, laminated uh, pine plywood for the exterior and interior. Now that was treated as well. And we have spotted gum on the external uh, floorboards. And of course the cork carried through from the concept design and was used on the interior. So just a quick uh, few images of the project when it was completed. It has this lovely attractive characteristic um, very neat and tidy there, of course, but then inhabited by its occupants and much loved. And one of the great surprises for us was the feedback that the building had a beautiful aroma. So of course, the timber was um, giving off uh, some of its natural aromas and that contributed to a great sense of well-being in this space. And we keep getting this feedback 
um, that the people using this facility, the incubator, um, just feel very relaxed and calm. I think it's a combination of the natural materials, its tactility, the beautiful light conditions, and the connectivity to the outside. And of course, the landscape has grown into its place now, and the building feels very much embedded and has been the recipient of lots of great industry awards for the contractor, the subcontractors, the engineering team, and architect and landscape architect. And a couple of photos just recently of the landscape that's really now filled in, and the building is just sitting beautifully in its context. Feels like it's been there forever. And although the building had been designed to be um, relocatable, um, we're a bit disappointed that we're not going to get to test that because the client loves the building so much in its current location, they've told us um, it's going nowhere, which is a, a lovely piece of feedback. But unfortunately, we won't get to prove um, the capacity for this building to be disassembled and relocated as it was uh, originally intended to be. Okay. Well, Moving on to our second case study, and, and this is perhaps um, the focus of today's presentation. I'll just check my time. Okay, we've got 15 minutes left in this se section, Mike and Kenga. So the Clinical Education Building is a teaching and learning building for the Faculty of Medicine at Macquarie University, positioned between the um, Macquarie University Private Hospital, shown there on the left, and an office building just behind it. And this is the conceptual model that we came up with together, Arab and Architectus, um, when we were first looking at the programmatic opportunities. And it had a really beautiful, um, again, exoskeleton uh, approach to the building's uh, structure. And um, I'm a bit disappointed we couldn't <coughs> realise this one, Mike and Kimber, so we'll have to do it another day. But initially, it was a building that had one crank in it here, and then a straight section. And as we uh, got to understand more of the constraints around the project and limitations on building footprint, we had to revise that approach. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we are at the eastern end of Macquarie University. This is Wally's Walk, which is a major organising spine to the campus, and it terminates right at the front door of the Clinical Education Building. This larger foot, foot, break, foot plate, excuse me, here is the private hospital, and this one is number 75 Talavera Road, which is an office building. And you can see in this uh, zoomed up site plan, we had to respond to a cranking condition um, with the footprint here that responded to the nature of this access and terminated that in the elevation to our project. And you can see that here, this cranking and then slightly different orientation to the previous drawing. This is that spine. So some beautiful excuse me, first architectural sketches from Nick Elias, who is my architectural colleague, and together with a team comprising Hope Dryden, Angela Collins, Angel Z Yang, and Hope Dryden, developed this project architecturally. <coughs> excuse me. Um, conceptually, in terms of the architectural response, we were really desiring to have a very permeable building that would promote visual connectivity between the inside and the outside, a bit like the incubator, but trying to take that to another level of clarity. It was to be a place for social interaction as well as teaching and learning. And it was to contribute to a more vibrant, warmer context at Macquarie Uni, which has been characterized by a lot of heavy, concrete, brutalist architecture. So it was a great opportunity to again, um, develop the skills that we had uh, collectively um, amassed during the incubator building and take that to a multi-storey project this time and express the timber again in a very powerful way. So the building had a range of um, functions, principally around teaching and learning. Uh, so there's a lecture theatre, a number of case study theatres based on the Harvard model, some team-based learning environments, circulation both horizontally and vertically, and mechanical plant on the roof, with this third level here being cold shell because the university did not have a purpose for it originally. And the brief uh, in terms of fit out was for these three levels um, initially. Another sketch from Nick showing the approach to the building in, in its early phases when we had this um, crank 
imposed upon the scheme. And we still wish to, like that um, exoskeleton solution we had initially, cantilever the building so that the termination of Wally's Walk actually passed through and beneath uh, this part of the building. Now, in structural terms, we had to um, pick up that cantilever and, and transfer the load in a different way that Mike and Kengo will talk about in a moment. moment. Now, because we're short on time, I think I won't dwell too much on the architectural components just at the moment, but it's worth reiterating that the building has a lot of um, blue lamb and cross laminated timber uh, comprising all of its primary structure, its core, its floor plates, and some of the, the stiffening uh, shear wall elements. And you can see here a few plans, vertical circulation in this area, a large lecture theatre, case study theatres and typical flat floor flexible spaces with a palette that drew some of its language from the incubator, of course, but really was responding to its local context of woodland at Macquarie University. And this was an initial architectural rendering. Um, in retrospect, probably showing uh, a greater degree of clarity through the glass than we were able to achieve ultimately. Um, but the intent was there. Can you go and Mike? Okay. Just picking up on the, the overall structure. Um, so the materials we used generally, we used as much mass timber construction as we could. It was interesting at the um, at the uh, tender stage, we had uh, utilized a concrete core, in situ concrete or precast core. Um, we're looking at a couple of options there, but encouraged by um, Adam Strong, who was advising at the time um, with Strong Build at that time in the ECI phase. Um, he was saying, well, you know, you really should be trying to do as much in mass timber as possible, partly because of the efficiency of it uh, all being pretty much all being mass timber above the uh, ground floor level, but also the proximity to Macquarie Uni Hospital, which is um, within about three or four metres away from this. So trying to keep the, um, the construction phase as silent and as um, as neat and, and tidy as possible. That was actually critical because there were surgery um, rooms just a few metres away, including um, brain surgery operations. Mm. And a monitor was put into those uh, surgery environments during the construction phase. And what it showed was that the garbage trucks cleaning the hospital bins were generating more vibration <laughs> than the entire construction of this building, which was phenomenal, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's been a fantastic site to, to demonstrate um, those aspects in terms of, um, and, and we're looking at that with other projects now where there's concern about uh, second phases of projects and disturbance on ex existing use of buildings and surrounding buildings that, that timber again is coming to the fore because of those particular aspects. Um, just to, to summarize the uh, materials we used, the Victorian ash um, columns, which are 550 by 550, they were made up of five um, 110 wide um, uh, beams and, and then assembled into columns, and that was sourced for, from Victoria. Uh, CLT floors, which are European spruce. Uh, CLT core elements, again, European spruce. Uh, there's a CLT core up on the right hand side there, adjacent to the external escape stairs as well. Um, and then the glue lamb columns and beams are all European spruce as well. And then small amount of steel work up on the plant area. And to create that, uh, that free space at the entrance or the continuation of Wally's Walk, uh, we had some steel beams to form a transfer there, which was something that we had uh, moved towards rather than expressed bracing and transfer within the, um, within the structure in the timber structure because I think there's extra complexity etc and we we felt that it was just going to be um, less complex to to have just a simple box, steel box beam transfer elements. I remember we were doing studies that um, tested some of the building flexure and movement weren't we the dynamic quality absolutely and this W column which is by the way a visual pun on the name Wally's walk which is that spine that terminates right here um, was the structural solution to that. So we might just, this, yeah, that's fine. Uh, going to the next slide. So just a quick slide to show the original scheme where we did have some a very dramatic cantilever that we're looking at either in um, all mass timber or um, with a combination of, of steel as well. But when the building cranked um, to doing cantilever would be much more difficult because you wouldn't have had a, a backspan to that cantilever. So that's when we went to having the W columns out in the front. 
Um, just continue to the next one. Yeah, so just uh, a little bit more discussion about the sizes, I suppose. The uh, CLT core was um, 180 thick uh, elements and 240 thick uh, glue lamb beams are typically spanning 15 meters and they're 1.38 uh, meters deep. And the, uh, and the floor, uh, CLT floors were typically 140 thick elements. We're going to have to speed up, I yep. think, my friends, otherwise yep. we won't get to the end. So I'm going to skip through this. Is, these just give a bit more detail. You can see, see the patterns on the floors where the CLT were cut. Up to the and roof. then up to the roof with some steel work up around the uh, plant areas. And the transfer beams here, the steel box transfer beams, they were clad in timber um, to give them a fire rating as well. And you can see here the lateral stability. So we used a CLT core. You can actually see on the bottom left-hand corner how it's, it is more flexible towards that left-hand end. Um, but the W column is quite clearly giving some additional stability and stiffness to that, that edge. Um, coordination is very important on these projects. Uh, everything was 3D modeled um, before it went out to tender. And it's extremely important to, uh, to model the services, whereas on other projects, you can have the subcontractor come through and finalize positions of, of ducts and, and uh, openings, et cetera. On something like this, where a majority of the material was being fabricated in, in um, Europe and being shipped out, uh, these have to be resolved um, within a few millimeters, many months before they might do for a concrete structure. And the, uh, and, and the notching for um, the, of the beams for the air ducts distributing air in the building were critical. We, we chose to notch them at the end of the beam so that there was greater efficiency in terms of the, uh, the amount of char. If you actually put a hole through the middle of that and, and had timber remaining above and below, there'd be a much greater impact of the, uh, the charring around that and less efficiency in terms of the member that's left. Another key aspect of these projects is, um, is acoustics. So a lot of uh, work going into the treatment of the flanking sound between rooms and from one level down to the next, and then also um, to the treatment of the ceiling below. And dynamics as well, another key, key issue that uh, we had to deal with at the very tip, we had three meter cantilever and we used the mullions of the, uh, some structural mullions to link those cantilever floors to avoid excessive dynamic behavior as demonstrated in the photo. The typical uh, beam uh, column connections works very well. We developed, uh, uh, we designed a 15 meter long glue lamp beam, uh, which are uh, supported by notched column, and they are bearing on uh, top of the uh, 150 mil uh, depth of the column. And uh, it, uh, it, it, it took only 10 to 15 minutes to install because uh, yep, it, it, the detail is quite uh, efficient. And also, uh, next, next slide, please. Sorry. Yep. And then in terms of procurement, the uh, we architect us and Arab have developed LOD 350 model, which includes includes all uh, recess penetrations and notches for, for connections. And the shop detail has developed it further to create uh, the fabrication model and each uh, 1,341 individual pieces were given a code to track its journey to site and then going to the site. And then the, uh, it took only three months to install all timber elements. It's, it's amazing. And here we just have a few construction uh, phase photographs. Is there anything you want to add to these, Michael Kinko? Otherwise, we'll just go, no, through, just go through, through them. Yeah. But again, it's another a beautiful dramatic sequence of the building uh, coming together very rapidly um, in that quick installation and assembly process that Kinko was outlining. and. Um, here we have the, the floor to uh, floor glazing going in, the internal linings, um, some of the finishes in the final days, a lift of a prefabricated glazing panel, of course. And then again, a bit like the incubator, this beautiful quality of the building having transparency that is most uh, appreciated in the evening when the building glows from the inside out. Um, again, a lovely environment that people gravitate towards and feel good about occupying um, the interior of. These are some photographs that Brett Boardman took upon completion and handover. And my colleague Sam Morris there, who was instrumental in seeing the architectural um, servicing through. 
lovely detailing that's carried throughout. But with a facade like this um, that uh, endeavours to maximise its transparency so that that experience of the timber can be revealed to exterior, you do face moments in the day like this where with the angle of the sun and the light quality, the facade, of course, can be quite reflective. So it's something that we are very, very mindful of in our projects. Um, and we wish to perhaps now embark on another journey um, with our timber buildings. So let us just for a moment take you to Japan. Kengo, this is the um, five-storey pagoda at Mount Haguro. Haguro yes. And how old is this one? 650 years old. Yeah, yeah. can you imagine that? <laughs> so um, a design life that's um, surely exceeded its expectations. But why has it been able to do that? In an environment that has lots of rainfall and indeed snow loading as well, um, it's an approach to the facade, if you like it, even though this is not a building, as you can see, to be occupied, it's uh, an edifice of worship. Um, the ability of this uh, device, of this swooping roof to protect the main timber structure um, is a, a really great approach. And it, it's giving us inspiration as we approach our new projects um, that we're working on together, Arup and Architectus, including a 15 storey building we're currently uh, designing um, for a university in Australia that has lots of mass timber in it, doesn't it? So we're now on a journey that's commenced with a one storey incubator, gone to a four storey multi-level building and is now um, on the path to being perhaps the tallest timber building in Australia, um, if we do get to um, see that all the way through, which we fully anticipate. And our approach, although I can't illustrate it to you yet because it's confidential to our client, is not um, dissimilar to this in its fundamental approach of giving shade and shelter to ex exterior so that we can get the highest VLT possible on the glass as well as great self-shading and performance. And through that strategy, reveal the timber day and night to its exterior. And so I guess it's um, we're really fortunate to have had a great client at Macquarie University to um, develop our thinking around uh, mass timber engineering and how it can create incredible uh, human-centered environments. And that we are now fortunate to take that to another level again. So I think we're out of time. Um, uh, on behalf of Mike and Kengo and our teams at Arup, at Architectus, at Build Corp, at Lippmann, um, Adam and Tim Strong, Aspect Studios, and many others who've helped us realise this, these projects. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Luke, Kengo, and, and Mike. Brilliant presentation, and uh, well done. And uh, thank you for taking the time. You've, you've done exceptionally well. The, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions, and and probably aim it towards uh, Mike and Kengo. I know the. Uh, the structural layout, you have a very closely centered um, primary beams. So what what drove the uh, the structural layout? Yeah, it's, um, it's driven by facade panels. It's 2.4 meter spacing on the column two columns. So we, I mean, we explored a number of options early on. And, um, and, and there is an option, I suppose, if you wanted to use the minimal amount of material, you you might have those columns at six meter centers, something like that, but you'd end up with a very deep edge beam as well. So I think the advantage here was to have columns at the 2.4 meter centers that are aligning with every one of those beams and you can keep a very thin edge. So it was a very conscious decision at that point and then also um, minimize uh, the, the requirement for mullions as well because you're utilizing the structural columns as, as the facade support element. So it was a, as a, a balancing act at, at the beginning in a, in a, I suppose, judging priorities in terms of um, the architecture and the effect you would see from the edge. I think if we had it, at, if we had the columns at six meter centers, you wouldn't have as clear a, a, a rhythm of, of the columns coming down and you would have ended up with a, a quite a solid element at every floor mm. along that edge. I might just see if I can find, yeah, this sort of image um, illustrates that, uh, repetitious rhythm um, that is given to the space and look as you described very good structural reasons for doing this it was also architectural that um, my colleague Nick Elias and the team uh, really wanted this effect as well with light falling on those columns and uh, 
going into the interior in this delightful way. But I think these sorts of decisions, it's it's something when, I mean, we're very lucky with a, a client like Macquarie University that, um, that these decisions, you have uh, very close discussions on these at the beginning to, to and, and be very transparent about what the options are and what the strengths are of some of these decisions over others and, and make those decisions, I think, with that, uh, with that knowledge. Okay, that's great. That's sort of uh, a great explanation. So let's get on to the questions from our uh, participants. So, and the uh, uh, first one is actually based on, on the incubator. And it's a statement and a question, I and it's from Anonymous. I assume that the rafters that continued from outside to inside had to be treated to H3.1, so it's for Kiwi. Did you have any issues with smell of the treatment internally? It's actually not H3 treatment uh, treated uh, for the rafters, although the V columns are H3 treated. So there's no issues with smell of the treatment internally. Yeah, so that's a similarity between um, the incubator and the uh, clinical education building. In both of them, uh, the only treatment is to the, the V columns or the W columns uh, because they are exposed to wind, dri uh, wind driven rain. Uh, but anything that's protected from wind-driven rain or, or moisture um, uh, are left untreated. Yeah, yeah, that's, I agree with you. That's the uh, thing. It doesn't need it because it's, it's been covered up voluntarily by the uh, envelope of the building. But I think even the, um, the, the thinking through the connections at the bottom of the V columns are uh, very important to, to ensure that uh, you'll get drainage so that you don't have the accumulation of water as well. Okay. And it drains through these boards. Yeah. So please forward your questions on. Uh, we'll get the next question from Matthew. Matthew wants to know what software we use for the 3D structural analysis. We use the several structural analysis software, but uh, mainly we use the GSA, which is uh, our Arab in-house structure package, and uh, in, for to to check lateral stability of the uh, buildings. Okay. Thank you. Another one from Anonymous. What GLT considerations for the slab? So, was GLT considered for the slab in lieu of CLT? Since it's a one way uh, spanning structure. The CLT is a, uh, is a structure diaphragm. So, we, we want like two way uh, in plane stiffness and strength. So, that's, uh, that's uh, better compared to a glue lamp one way system. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from Diana. Could you talk more about the service articulations and strategy? CLT software does not appear to be exposed. So which building? <laughs> uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the, the second, second case study. Okay. Let's see if we can find a good image to speak to that. So we've got uh, services, uh, literaturations uh, uh, in, in, in the ceiling, and we've got uh, not at the top of the beam, which allows services to run through the beams. And then the CLT floor is covered by a fire protection board. And also we've got a ceiling. Maybe we have- Yeah, this, a, this is a good shot. Yep. Yeah, so the, um, so from an acoustic point of view, um, we needed the, the carpet and the, the 40 millimeter screen, and I think dynamics as well. And so good, yep. um, and, and then you could see the, I suppose this isn't quite to scale. I think the ceiling is down a little bit further, um, but the primary beam, beam, sorry, the primary beams are much deeper and, and they are expressed. Let's see if we can find an image of that. Yeah, so, so both in terms of services distribution and fire rating and acoustics, the, um, the soffit of the CLT wasn't expressed. And Luke, probably a, a comment on that one, Art, actually, is that, is that okay by you? Oh yeah, um, we are now in the other project I was referring to, exploring um, having the, the CLT exposed uh, on the interior to the 15 storey building. So a different approach. Um, and yeah, look, I think you can get great outcomes with, with both. It's a different aesthetic with the exposed ceiling, of course, because you've then got to be very careful about detailing all of your um, services. And it's a, a different quality of um, finish. Okay. Probably a similar question. So I'm just going to 
just stated, uh, and I think many have already answered, but in anonymous is given for the first level suspended CLT slab was a soffit expose or a non structural timber cladding U. If it was the CLT structural slab, how was the how was this treated for durability and acoustic point of view? Yeah, I think we've answered that. So it was a suspended ceiling for the clinical education building. The CLT was not exposed. And what did you do for the where the W columns were? Was that uh, was that outside? Was that uh, exposed timber or was there a ceiling used there as well? It's exposed timber. That in terms of W column, it's H three 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 treated. So the um the underside of the floor was it's that exposed? Covered, yeah. it's, it's covered by cladding, not by structure element. It's Actually, there is a steel uh, transfer beam on top of the double columns, and then it's, it's covered by cladding. But that darker timber there is a, a, a essentially ceiling. Yeah, ceiling. a suspended lining. Okay. The, something. I'm just seeing this. Just trying to see what the uh, next questions are. Okay, Howard, Howard has asked, what's is it a DC price versus GFA, please? So Sorry, could, you, could so you ask that again, Andrew? The question is a, it's a bit in, uh, in uh, it's, it's referring to, I think it's pricing. So was it a DNC price or was it, is there a price for GFA? Look, the, the total sum of the contract is confidential for both of those projects. Um, the they were both procured through ECI uh, processes where the contractor and the client agreed to a maximum price and worked to that. Okay, another question, Deanne. Who was the supplier to the glue lamb and CLT in the Ainsworth building? Window holes, yep, window holes for typical glue lamb columns and CLTs, but we use uh, Australian sustainable hardwood for, for double columns. And, yep. and look, we, we were very encouraging, of course, of the timber, all of the timber being supplied locally. But for, at the point in time with committing to um, their purchase of those materials, it wasn't commercially advantageous to get it from Australia. It was actually better to import it from Europe. Actually, there's an interesting point, though, when a bit fell off the back of a truck, True. There's a little bit of XLAM. Uh, <laughs> That's right. We should call. We should thank the XLAM team because um, they did come to the party on the clinical education building. As Mike said, when some of the imported timber went uh, astray, um, very quickly they were able to supply a, an equivalent uh, CLT panel. Which shows, you know, with the maturity industry here, how much better that should be for projects. Yeah. That uh, that you know, well, things can be turned around much more quickly as well as the 15 story building we're working on, there's also another building equivalent to the clinical education building that um, we have investigated sourcing the timber from locally and it hasn't yet been purchased. We still hope we can um, get a commercially adv advantageous offer locally. Okay, another one from Diana. How did you manage the logistics and, and need, need to store the timber off site prior to installation on site? Look, um, we'd really need our friends from uh, Lippmann Strong Build for Incubator and Build Corp for the Clinical Education Building to talk about that in detail. But um, for the Incubator, the billets were delivered to Northwestern Sydney at Strong Build's um, fabrication property. And there it was milled and assembled into the modular components. And for the Clinical Education Building, there was a different approach where that all of the fabrication occurred uh, in Binderholz's fabrication yard in Austria, and then was shipped in containers, temporarily stored in a warehouse in Sydney, and then in a sequential manner brought out to site and lifted into place. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. So, a question from Samantha: Has there been has there been on-site testing done for vibration to check if the predicted values match reality? There's a picture of on-site testing. <laughs> no. Um, look, um, just I'll try to find that picture of the on-site testing, um, which was a very scientific process, of course. Um, look, just uh, off the cuff, at the incubator, um, there was a bit of wobble in the building, um, and that was um, evidenced by a, a data projector that had been mounted on the underside of 
the exposed uh, structural diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And it had a very slight wobble to it um, that meant that uh, we had to actually take it out uh, because the projection onto the screen was, of course, wobbly and re replace that with an LCD panel. Mm -hmm. So uh, informally, we knew there was just a gentle amount of sway in that building, but it's imperceptible uh, when you're there. But that was the incubator. Incubator. Yeah. On this one, this is very rigid, I think. Yeah, and the, um, the, the uh, projector is mounted from recollection is right towards the end of the uh, the long span B. Um, so it's very stiff at that point. But um, I can't recall, I mean, Arab did the acoustics um, and I don't recall what testing there was um, in the building, but uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the structural dynamics and the comfort criteria, um, you know, you, you, there's no perception of uh, of movement when you walk in in the building and where we had put a lot of effort into it was um was on the tip of the cantilever which we were i mean we joke around about us jumping on there but it was kind of a test mm -hmm. <laughs> to see if we could perceive any um movement yeah uh, and probably this is the last question so and uh, i apologize if i'm uh, that's your question it's from anonymous if you were going to do the project again what would you do differently uh, I think I, I touched on a bit of that, and it's the the treatment to the facade to self shade it. So, as illustrated by that five story Japanese pagoda, um, shading the facade is something that we would like to do for architectural and um, performance reasons. And indeed, that's what we are doing in um, some other current projects that we've got on the boards at the moment. This one, you were quite constrained on the envelope as well. Yeah, we, that's things true. Projecting from that is true. Yep. And structurally, is there any, anything different? I don't think there's been much that we've changed. <laughs> no. I think it went quite well. I think, uh, yeah, as a team at, uh, in, in, in partnership with uh, Bill Corp, who executed it, and uh, uh, the ongoing advice that we had from um, Shane Strong, it was a really good project. Andrew, it, it feels like we're approaching closing off. So, if that's okay, I'd just like to thank a few um, individuals who have contributed to both projects, just very quickly, if I may. Yep. On the um, clinical education building, um, we acknowledge and thank our client, of course, Macquarie University Property, and it was Tony Carton who worked on this one as project director, and John Staff were the project managers. We had an excellent team of contractors from BuildCorp with Dave Strallo, Julian Taran, and Ned Sadelich. We had a multidisciplinary team from Arif, Mike and Kengo are here today and they did an excellent job. And then architecturally, my colleagues, Nick, Angel, Hope, Angela and Sam were wonderful. And then on the incubator, um, again, Arif did multi-dis and I should acknowledge TTW who did contractor structural services mm -hmm. um, and a wonderful team, uh, Litman led by Philip Tondal, uh, Tim Capito, Patrick Wood, Adam and Tim Strong from Strong Build providing all of that mass timber fabrication and installation. Um, Jessica O'Neill and Chris Crick from Root Projects were the project managers. Tim Fowler and Sasha Coles from Aspect Studios. And uh, from Architectus, again, Nick, Angel, Hope and Taya Love um, all contributed very much to the project's success. Thank you. Thank you and well done to all those um, people. So now I'd like to thank the speakers, uh, Luke, Kingo and Mike, a wonderful presentation uh, and wonderful projects. So it's a, a great job done. So I'm just going to wrap it all up and uh, before we're just about there at uh, 12 o'clock. So just to remind you that the questions, they, they will be sent to you via the uh, uh, CPD form. Uh, remember that this webinar will be available in the weeks of time on the Solutions website. Site. And future webinars, we have a special special one coming on this Thursday. It's on timber school buildings. This is, a, this is a, around the team that worked on this, the uh, structure in a, in a infrastructure New South Wales uh, on schools, and uh, it's a quite a large presentation from the, the client, architect, engineer, and, and client surveyor. So that's uh, this Thursday at 11 a.m. So welcome to attend that one. Please book it in uh, for our next Tuesday one. This is uh, this is a by Tuesday. This one be so next one might be on until the second of March. So we have a best practice for help energy efficiency and healthy buildings would be by Mark Dewsbury from University of Tasmania. And uh, remember that the CPD points uh, certificate will be sent to you. Please retain that and keep them in the same place. 
And also a part of that uh, certificate being sent to you, there'll be a opportunity to to carry out a, a, a survey. Please could you take some time and do that because we appreciate your feedback. So in this point of time, I'd like to say thank you and thank you to the speakers and participants and we'll see you at the next Wood Solutions webinar, which is this coming Thursday.